awkward is like the perfect word. Yeah. yeah I just yeah, started yeah. the call, guys, and we'll start in about a minute or two, okay? Uh, so Can you'll start to see attendees come in. Do you mind um, sharing the link again in the chat of this, or is there a way to do it? I'm a little ignorant on sharing the meeting like publicly oh. so i can just remind a couple people yeah uh let's think about the fastest way to do that i think um, we are live now just fyi everybody yep we are live uh it's 10 59 we're going to start at about 1101 um let me see i can get that link for you it's a great idea might as well put it in yeah because i just want to put it on on my socials right now since yeah yeah everybody's immediate you know yeah i'll send it right <laughs> everyone so I'll see. if you want to share this I just okay. have to tell you guys um, that even though I am totally cognizant of its importance, the rate conversations do always make me laugh a bit because when I did my first deal in real estate in 1980, my buyer got a 17% mortgage. <laughs> um, uh that's crazy. Wow. What a way to start in real estate. Right? Yeah, but the, what year, but the what year was that, Fred? $300,000. 1980, Noah. 80. Yeah, Mark, Mark D., you just brought up a good point. The price was probably super low. Yeah. And that, to me, is what's so interesting about this time wind. Because it didn't the, the seem prices were still high. Time, Phil. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah, but, I, but the price but was a whole of, lot higher than it had been three years before. Right. But, but this uh, was, I mean, I have to tell you another one of my favorite stories from this period, which was a year or two after that, a friend of mine bought the penthouse duplex at the Beresford for $375,000. And I thought they were nuts. Yeah. Um. I'm go. saying that, 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 Scotty just go. put some interesting data in that message chat there. Cool. All right, let's get started. It's 11.01. This is our 42nd real estate chat we've had over the years. Welcome, everyone. We love these talks. We love this community. We love these panelists. Please note that this call, like the other calls that we have, are being recorded. We do these always on a Thursday at 11 a.m., and we do them with some of the top New York City real estate agents and experts in New York City. This time, as I mentioned to some of the panelists, I decided to spice up the chat a little bit as part of a part of the Zoom. So now all the attendees can send messages to everyone and we could respond back. I, it's a little risky, I know, but we're really trying to foster a community here. And so I think a healthy debate and chat can really help serve that goal. Please use this judiciously though. And please panelists help me moderate I won't be able to look at the chat much because I'll be hosting, obviously. Like our last chat in April, we're going to divide this talk into two halves. The first half, we'll talk about 30 minutes or so, and that'll be focused on the market, the real estate market itself, how that's doing. The second half, we're going to talk more about tips from top agents and experts on how you could thrive in a market like this, which... Let's face it, it's a little tough, and it's not just tough for agents, but also tough for our clients. So about me, my name's Phil, I'll be hosting today. I was a New York City real estate agent for 20 years about, and now I spend my time running Lease Break, which is a marketplace for shorter leases in New York City, over 30 days, but under 12 months. That's our specialty. You could post listings, search for listings, and you could even join our lead program as an agent where you can get exclusive rental listings or work with renters. So let's first turn to the market piece. So last time in April, if you remember when we spoke, things were okay, not great. There was some optimism. It was certainly not all doom and gloom. Uh, I remember Dan Morello, I thought, encapsulated what was going on pretty well. He described it as sort of a schizophrenic market. One week was great, another week not so great, or one of his agents was doing well, another agent's not doing well, one part of the city is doing well, one part's not doing well. So we're seeing a little bit of that uh, now uh, as well, but we really want to know where are we now? Uh, how would we characterize the spring market that we just had? And what do we think the summer market's going to be? So with that in mind, let's turn to now our experts and agents. First, as always, we have our resident data expert, Noah Rosenblatt. He's the founder of Urban Digs 
which is a incredible data analytics and market insights uh, insights platform, which many real estate agents subscribe to. Many people on this call actually subscribe to it. So usually we start with Noah. He provides a good base of data before we turn to the agents and experts uh, who will then provide a more sort of uh, boots on the ground, finger on the pulse perspective. And Noah, let's start with you. So how are things looking in real estate from a data perspective? And one thing I wanted to start off with is I read this headline yesterday. And note everyone, this is a dash, this is national data, not New York City. But it said existing home sales from February to May were at the slowest pace of that period since 2011. So that means that means in 2024 we're seeing the slowest pace of sales in 14 years. Now, I guess my first question, Noah, is is that what we're seeing also in New York City? And if you could also just explain what your thoughts are on data overall and where we are. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, thanks for having me um, with this amazing group of agents here. Um, I, I always I always enjoy these sessions. Um, we talked about it just before we started today. I, I, I really think this is a very confusing and awkward marketplace. Um, I do think that um, it is somewhat rate sensitive. We definitely are seeing some correlations when rates dip down a little bit. We're getting some buyers that are coming in. Um, I think there is rising uncertainty that is causing a general lower volume situation overall. If we don't break it down week to week, and if we just kind of take a look at how is the spring season, you know, how is February, March, April, May, and June, um, I, I think it's pretty slow. And I think a lot of it has to do with uncertainty. I think we're in a volume trap. Um, I, I think we're in this rising uncertain market. I think uncertainty is freezing a lot of investors. I think uncertainty is freezing a lot of buyers. Um, and I think until that uncertainty wanes, it probably won't wane over the next four or five months. It'll probably just linger there. But until that happens, I think we're going to be in this lower volume market. Now, you asked me this question um, about um, whether or not the first six months of the year are seeing as, as bad of a slowdown as existing home sales. So to try to answer that question, Phil, um, we gathered our data team this morning. We whipped up this chart right here. Um, which basically shows um, contract activity. So we're not looking at sales. You know, sales is a little lagging, right? We're looking at contracts signed from January up into June this year in 2024. And then we looked at that number and said, okay, how does that compare to January through June of all the other years? And when you look at it, we're, we're number 14 out of 17. Okay, we're number 14 out of 17. I think Nikki is raising her hand and I, I, I cannot say no to Nikki. So I don't know how to do that, Phil. <laughs> uh, oh, I think she's, I don't know. I think she's saying, I think you're okay, Noah. Keep, keep going. Okay. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I, I'll imagine she could say something if she wants to. But at, generally speaking, again, when you take a step back and you look at contract activity, that is where we are. And that's what I'm talking about. I feel like it's a slow market. Um, I feel like it's a challenging market in terms of the temperature of the market. Um, we're probably near neutral in terms of listing climate, but you know, typically for the spring cycle, we're at a higher level. I don't think we had a strong spring. I think we had a strong February and March and maybe early April. And then it kind of weakened out for April, May, and into June. And now it's starting to pick up again. And when I think about price action, I just want to show this chart real quick so it can visualize what I'm trying to say. Um, we are definitely down from last year, um, and we probably fell somewhere between like 8 and 10%, and we've had a little recovery. And that little recovery, if you take a look at that last point, that's March. If you signed a contract in March and you closed, that's the March print. So I think February and March is probably, in hindsight, going to reflect the stronger part of our of our 2024 campaign thus far. And I feel like as we get more data for those that sign contracts in April, in May, today, if they sign the contract today, where's that going to be? I feel like it's going to be something like this. I almost feel like this orange point right here a few months ago is kind of where we're at right now. Of course, time will tell, but I just feel feel like whatever recovery we had a few months ago, it's faded slightly since then, Phil. 
And the uh, from peak to trough in terms of pricing, it looks like 2000 on that chart, 2022 was the peak. So we're down from what? What would you say? Like, is that 10% from the from the peak in terms of pricing? Yeah, this is resale condo price per square foot. So we take out new developments. And I also did it 500,000 to 10 million. So we kind of got that outliners out. And I think it's somewhere about 8%, 7, 8% or something like that. If you look at the whole market overall, it might be a little more, it might be closer to nine or 10%. I like to give a range. I would say somewhere between eight and 12% is probably what that peak to trough was. And I feel like that trough, that bottom was winter of last year call it september october november that late fall winter was probably the bottom phil great thanks a lot noah, noah. noah okay. can i ask you a question i've noticed sure. in the um the ocean report that actually the spring months have been stronger on four million and up than the first quarter so could you parse your numbers a little because that's a little different from what you were saying? Yeah, I could. I just I just won't be able to get it for today's uh, session. So I don't know how to speak on it because I don't know what that data is showing. But definitely the, the luxury market did pick up, especially that first quarter. That first quarter. What I'm really questioning is like the second half of April up until maybe early June. Um, and that's that's the period I feel like we faded just a little bit. But I, that's something we'll have to look up. Okay, great. Thank you, Noah. So let's speak now to some of our agents and experts on the panel to get more of a finger on the pulse perspective. And also I'll ask the agents to give a number between one and 10, one being a strong buyer's market, 10 being a raging seller's market. And this is a great way for us to just compare session to session, how things are looking. So uh, Nikki, could you hear me? I know you're on the street there. Could you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, wonderful. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the market right now. What are you saying? I would say I'm pretty solidly a five. And Noah used a word earlier that it's awkward. It's very awkward. And everything it takes forever, forever plus to get to an offer. And the contract. Every single situation is... It's just extraordinary and it's hard. And the, the easiest way to be the best prepared is literally with the data. It's the only thing that's gonna help you advise your clients on either side and get to that sort of endpoint. As I stand outside of one of my endpoints, it's happening now. So that's, that's really my best advice to people. I know that it's really, really hot and we are all exhausted. Take care of yourselves but don't take your foot off the pedal. Immerse yourself in the data because when you're out socializing wherever you may be, if you take some time off, people are going to ask you the question, what is going on? And you wanna be able to give them accurate data and also your take on it. Like I'm exhausted, I've been working every day for months and, but I'm seeing the results and what we're doing now is going to help us in the fall. So. Stick, stick in there. But awkward is like the best word ever. I'm sticking with that one, Noah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Nikki. I know you have to head to a closing, so we'll let you go. Thank you so much. Um, hopefully you could join us for the second half, but if not, we understand I will, why. I will be here the whole, the whole time. I am at a closing where there's no room. I don't even know why I'm here. Well, I'm here because my client asked me to be here. Um, but <laughs> first time since 2020, actually coming in person. What an experience. Nice. Nice, nice. Well, thank you so much, Nikki. So let's head to Frederick Warburg. Peters would love to hear your thoughts on the market right now and what you're seeing. You know, I like to call a market like this a broker's market. Um, I too am around five, but I think that this is the situation in which brokers get to shine. Um, Sellers are anxious, buyers are anxious, obviously for different reasons. And it's up to us to figure out the ways in which we can ease them into making decisions that we feel that they probably don't, they want to make, but feel anxious to make. And 
this actually tends to be my favorite kind of market because I feel like it's the one in which we're really challenged to bring our best game forward. And I think that game involves building a solid relationship of trust with the client and moving on from there. So I will have more to say about that in part two, but that's plenty for now. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Fred. Uh, Brian Morgan, first time on the show. Brian runs an extremely successful team at Corcoran. And like many of you on the panel, uh, one of the top agents in the city. Brian and I have actually crossed paths many times because we both worked for City Habitats and then Corcoran. So, uh, Brian, would love to hear your thoughts on the market. I, I know you are uh, uh, you love to consume data and you're always kind of advising your clients and trying to help them the best you can. I'd love to know how you're, how you're advising them right now. What are you seeing out there? How would you characterize this market? Hey, so, Phil, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's um, an honor to be around all of these um, professionals, people that uh, many of them I know for a long time or at least have uh, heard of. And I uh, thank you for inviting me to this panel and uh, looking forward to uh, spending time with everybody. To answer your question, I think we're, we're I think, but maybe two or three weeks ago, I thought we were like at a three and now maybe we're at a five. Um, I think these little interest rate ticks, the market is extremely sensitive to. And now more so than ever. Now, I don't think that's necessarily a reflection of what should be or shouldn't be, but I think there's an emotional component to these rates going down. And when buyers see that it happens, they tend to want to get off the sidelines and pounce while they can get that lower rate. Now, I'm not saying I agree with that or don't agree with that, but that's what I'm seeing that's happening out in this market right now. Uh, anecdotally, at least the data is not in, you know, uh, maybe in two, three weeks, it will be in terms of the contracts getting signed. As we all know, due diligence can take a couple of weeks at times. Um, you know, you think due diligence takes a week, but it's always two or three, at least I feel like. So <laughs> we don't, what I'm seeing today is not going to be reflective on urban digs. It will be in about a week and a half or two weeks, or maybe even three. So I'm seeing a bump. I, I'd love to hear what everybody else is seeing, uh, but I'm seeing a bump right now. And if these rates remain low, I think we'll have a relatively productive summer. And some of these listings that were sitting around and price, you, you have this mix right now, right? Where sellers are getting desperate and the rates are coming in. And I think that could create deal flow for the summer. Now, if rates tick back up, all bets are off. You know, we do have an election coming up. People don't like uncertainty. And if rates tick up along with the election, then I think it'll everyone will hold back. But with this rate, with the prices coming down and the rates coming down, I think we might have, uh, we could possibly have a better July than June. I know that's crazy to say, but it could happen. Yeah, it seems like seasonality is just kind of, Getting out more and more out the window, huh? Yeah, and, um, and I, guess I wanted to yeah. say one more thing. You know, Noah brought up those charts, which I love. And, I, I, you know, I, I even said in the chat, I want him to send those to me too, because I thought that was a great chart. But he mentioned something I think is extremely important. At the end of last year, Powell came up and was very dovish. And you saw the 10-year treasury drop. And I think that brought a lot of fear, a lot of FOMO into the market. And people were worried there wasn't going to be enough inventory. And they jumped on the market in late January and February and early March. So in my opinion, what's happened in this spring is those numbers would be even lower if you took out that, that six to seven week period where there was a little bit of a sniff of a bull market. All of that was gone. But now what we're seeing in the last week, as I was saying before, that could all change again. So again, it all goes back to the rates and what Powell says and what the 10-year treasury does. And so everyone you know, just has to really watch that very carefully because it's so important. Great. Thank you so much, Brian, for the thoughts and, and welcome again to the panel. So let's now move to Scotty. Scotty, what are you seeing out there? Uh, what's your number between one and 10? And... Uh, um, yeah, I mean, what are you what are you thinking about for the summer market? 
Well, if uh, what one is a buyer's and ten is a seller's market, I correct. I, correct. Still, I still land around five um, because I mean I think we're past you know peak of like asking for ridiculous prices, and I'm dealing you know my framework is mostly like co-ops downtown and typically like smaller ones, not new dev or anything like that. Um, but I think, you know, what the panelists are saying, what Brian mentioned, but just how hypersensitive, I mean, the rate, you know, we've been watching the rates and just going from like, even like a 6.75, let's say to like a 6.35 for 30 year fixed, like makes people actually way more motivated to like, at least start looking and getting out there instead of getting off the internet, but actually getting out on the street to look at these things. And what I find interesting too, is that the way the phone calls have hit me in the last two weeks from sellers and from buyers has been way more than May and June. So I think that tracks with what people are saying. So if it's happening to me and it's happening to you guys, there must be something happening out there where people are actually starting to get serious and all of these cycles that we used to have, you know, with like, you know, we'd be so busy in, in April, May, and then things shut down right after like Memorial Day and whatever. I don't know. I'm busier in the next couple of weeks than I would have been at any point in May. Um, and I'm not sure why. And maybe, you know, and I do, you know, rentals as well. So that has been totally jamming also. Like I, that's that's something where every single rental listing I've had and I would say they're in the ballpark of like four grand to let's say, um, you know, actually 20, I have one for 28. Now we, we've had to take a lot of these properties off just off the market completely, even before they sign leases, because we got so bombarded by people just looking for places like anything they want the video. They're not in town. They want a video tour. They want to put sight unseen on these rentals. And it's like, it's nuts. So, I've been like incredibly busy just in the last couple of weeks. And it's actually pretty encouraging to see the sales side. And I have a couple, probably what's going to be a private exclusive um, downtown for, you know, we'll try that for a few weeks and see how that goes. And normally I would tell people, hey, don't list in August, but the inventory that I'm seeing downtown right now at price points, let's say for regular people under a million, um, I'm not seeing much inventory at all. People are waiting for the next thing. And with rates ticking down ever so slightly, um, I think these properties, if listed at the right price, can go very quickly because people really are looking for the next thing. And also people are tired of overpaying for their rentals. So that's part of the equation. So the math makes sense if you are just looking for like a first time home or a parent buying for children or whatever it is right now downtown where it necessarily doesn't make sense to rent a $5,000 one bedroom that you don't even like. So it's been very interesting to see this happening over just really the last two weeks. So I'm gonna be curious to see what the data, uh, what data comes out from NOAA just in the, in the next couple of weeks. So I'm, I'm actually very excited right now for a very healthy July. Great. Um... Awesome. Thank you so much, Scotty. So let's move to uh, Dan Morello, Senior Manager and Director at Compass. So you have a nice view of things. A lot, you work with a lot of agents. Obviously, you manage a lot of different agents. So you have a nice perspective. What are you seeing? Are you seeing the same kind of bump that people are seeing? Um, I know you were very cautious that one time when we all thought the market was raging and you were like, hold on, folks, and you were 100% right. So uh, what do you see now? So, Phil, I have a crystal ball. Um, that I look at every day. No, Scotty, I'll ask you a question. Is if we had this meeting two weeks ago, would you be so bullish on July? No. You wouldn't. So I think this is like, and not to be negative here, but I think you have a quick spurt in the market that came after the Fed meeting and there was a slight decrease in rates. You had a bunch of people come into the market. I think... That's what people are busy with right now. Uh, to someone's point in the in the chat, 
some of these deals are very hard to put together or falling apart left and right. You're seeing the contracts signed or kind of whatever right now. Um, I don't see us having a really busy summer. I don't see the fall being a great fall market unless something miraculous happens in rates. Uh, we are headed into an election year. Um, so um, I think it's going to be more of the same for the rest of the year. Um, I don't see the summer getting busier, just simply, I mean, we're already seeing supply contract right now. You're starting to see it go down, and it's going to continue to go down um, in July and August. Um, my advice for sellers is, or for brokers is to have co real conversations with their sellers and saying, if this isn't moving right now and you really need to liquidate this property, I think you've got three choices or possibly two, depending on whether you're a cop or not, is we reduce the price to X, we take it off the market until 2025, or we rent it if you have that option. Um, otherwise, nothing's going to move here. Right. If you're waiting for something to happen, I just don't see that happening. Right. And again, our job is as advisors to liquidate their asset. They don't really need to liquidate. And I would say, wait, um, I think what the last year has taught us is that none of us can time the market. None of us can predict what's going to happen. Um, I think all of us have been wrong for the most part. Uh, if you asked me last August, I would say, yeah, we're going to have probably a quiet fall. And then the spring is going to be insane and it definitely wasn't insane um so i would say on the listing side of it um agents have to be very very um uh, uh, careful and diligent in getting all the information they need when listing the property because any little hiccup is throwing a deal off um you know we're dealing with all this local uh, law 11 stuff and financing like make sure you know what banks are financing we're dealing with a CMO issue in, in another building. Like you've got to make sure that every roadblock that you know of, you know how to overcome because that time is going to kill your deal. Um, and that's why a lot of these deals are taking forever. And there's, there's all these different road bumps. Um, so I, I don't know if I answered your question. I think right now it's the market's probably a four to five, maybe a four and a half. Um, and then I think we'll see the inevitable quiet down for the summer. Bill, can I jump in and ask Noah a question based on what Dan just said? Um, it, I am putting data together now for my second quarter market report. And um, one of the charts I pulled up from Urban Digs is the um, months of supply chart. And the months of supply number, and this is kind of, you know, a, a little bit of a contradiction maybe to what Dan was saying. The months of supply chart has basically skyrocketed since January. There has been a huge, I was only doing 2 million and under, but there has been a huge relative increase in months of supply on the market since then. So Noah, do you see that tapering off as the summer goes on? Probably. I wonder how much of that is a lag effect as well of closing data um, versus where we are now. Um, I also wonder um, whether or not it's, it's reflective of a market whose temperature has kind of been rough, right? I mean, we're saying four to five. Think about what we're saying. Yeah. We're saying four to five on the Richter scale here. I don't know what we call it here, the Phil scale. Um, and that's an and and we're all admitting that the last two, three weeks was a spurt. And that spurt brought us to four to five. So like that's a kind of a, 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 a cooler number, um, a more challenging climate. So I wonder if that's reflecting that as well in just a different way, in a different way. You know, yeah. or if it's a yeah. lagging yeah. element as well, that may slowly come down with those sales as they come in through the pipeline. Oh, wonderful. Let's get, let's keep, uh, let's keep moving along. So I want to make sure the first half, we try to stay as close to 1130 as we can. We may go over a little bit, but uh, so let's move to William Bowles. William, what do you got for us? I'd love to also know your thoughts, if you don't mind, on the Connecticut market as, as well. Yes, yes. Uh, good morning. So. Now, I always hate 
giving a number to the market. I'm only giving it a five because it depends on the property, the, its condition, <laughs> how motivated the seller is, how long they've owned it, um, all the things, right? It's because my summary of the market is it is incredibly spotty. Um, deals are very hard to get together and stay together. I have a listing um, where we've had three false starts on um, that we just can't get a contract signed. And it's, and all of them have been buyers changing their mind. Yeah. Right. It's like nothing to do with the property. So um, I think it is, I think it is challenging. This is my 20th year of doing this. This is one of the more challenging markets. I can't say it's the most, but it, 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 it's a deep well of patience and we have to guide people well. Um, uh, that being said, I love this positivity of the spur and activity. So I, so I came into the city last Sunday to do some showings and open houses. I was booked solid from 1045 till four in the afternoon with a buyer. Um, it was good seeing it from the buyer's eyes. And then from the listing side, showing two listings, people were out, man. It was 95 degrees and they were out and they were looking and they were, they, I mean, that's not a tire kicker day. That is, that is like, we're really out trying to find something. So I think that is great. I hope that that all translates into all of us to sign contracts in a week or two. Um, and then, and it's, and so I'm in the part of Connecticut that is very rural. It's an hour from the coast. It's the country. It is a lot of New York buyers who buy weekend homes or like myself have moved up there full time. Um, it is very quiet. We, we, uh, same thing, not a deep bench of buyers. Um, we tend to move with the city, um, a little bit more than other markets. It's too far to commute every day. So it really is your weekend place or, or, or empty nester place. You sell the place in the city and you move up there and it seems to be trending with the, with the city. I, again, hard to keep deals together. Everybody want every, people being buyers, being picky. Um, and, and I am trying to entice buyers with price. I feel like this is a market that you have to give a compelling product to get them off the fence. To me, that is price. And of course, presenting it in the best way possible, staging, et cetera, all of that. So hopefully that's helpful. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, William. Let's move now to Mark D. Mark D, if you have some thoughts on the market, we'd love to hear them. Well, I will say that listening to these fine experts today uh, talk about and give all their advice, they're all right uh, in their own way. Um, you know, it, it is a disjointed market. Um, you know, and we've all been in disjointed markets before, uh, you know, ever since COVID. And, um, you know, the price, is, uh, the price is really it. I mean, you can talk about the interest rates. You can talk about politics. Everybody's got an excuse. The, the buyers are are out there. I mean, I've seen them. Uh, they're not out in droves. I haven't seen them in droves, depending on the, the price point. But if your product is priced right, uh, you'll get some sales. And I've had, you know, buyers who are, you know, competing with other buyers on the same property. And some properties are completely dead. And the only reason is because it's not priced right, it, it, you know, given the circumstances of what's going on. So, yeah, the, I would say that when you're talking about four and five, I, I would give it a five, uh, you know, a solid five. I think we, ha we have had a little bump uh, recently. It was a little slow, and now it's picked up a little bit. You know, it's it's the ebb and flow of the market, guys. You, you know, it happens all the time. So it's, it's nothing new, but I think uh, it's definitely, it's all based on price and, and, and how you show it. If you're if you're this if you're on the seller side, I don't do a lot of rentals, so I'm, I can't really talk about the rentals. But that's what I'm seeing on the sales side. Thank you, Mark D. Uh, by the way, thanks Dan for being the only one so far that hasn't said five. You kind of said four or five. Uh, come on, you guys are so boring with the fives. Anyway, um, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, if hey, if, if you think it's a five, I guess you think it's a five. Um, I'm gonna for now. I'm gonna I'm gonna start saying maybe next time you can't say five. What are you gonna do then? What are you gonna do then? Anyway, um, okay, uh, just kidding. Mark D, thank you very much. Scott Harris, you've been away for a while. We missed you, buddy. I just want to let you know, we missed you. We're happy to have you back. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts on the market. Well, thanks for having me back. Uh, you almost kicked me out. I said, don't kick me out. It's just been the scheduling on Thursdays <laughs> has been hard. Glad to be here. Um, you know, there, there's a, a quote, I, I probably butcher it from Patrick Moynihan, former senator of New York State. You're entitled to your own opinions. You're not necessarily entitled to your own facts. And in this case, there are lots of different facts, 
that sort of will give the answer to how the market's doing. You know, at the luxury end, it's different than at different parts. If it needs work, it's different than if it, if it doesn't. Um, I give the market a four. Um, but again, you know, I we just had a contract signed uh, in a day and a half. It was the fastest contract sign we've had in a while. Beautifully renovated Upper East Side, two bedroom apartment in a in a you know townhouse near Fifth Avenue, and they had multiple bids behind them. Like it was boom, 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 boom. You know, and so I think what what we're seeing is that luxury product and all cash buyers, people less focused on mortgage rates, are making decisions they want to make, and it's really function. It's a function of how much people are focused on the mortgage rates, right? It's not whether they need, whether it moves the needle for them, whether they can afford a higher mortgage rate or not. It's just how focused they are. So, you know, a lot of what we're doing right now is just trying to strip away all the things that are complicating these deals and try to make sure people are focusing on the things that matter. Um, and in a lower inventory rate, in a lower inventory environment, it becomes challenging. People just decide there's not enough to see. They need more inventory to make an educated decision. So it's like, how can we educate them? How can we help them make informed decisions? But um, we're having our best year ever in, in this challenging environment. I think it's a lot about how can you keep your buyers and sellers focused on getting deals done? And sometimes that means not you know deciding hey let's kick the conversation a little bit forward when you can't get them out of their own way and i think to echo what dan is saying we told a lot of sellers take your apartment off the market or don't even bring it on they want to sell and we're like based on our conversation let's wait and i think that'll happen you'll have a lot of people who are just ready soon they're just not ready yet and i think there's there's a lot um there's just a uh, you know what what frederick had to say this is the best time to be a good educated broker. Like if you can have really, you can make a huge impact more now than ever in your clients' lives because you're going to really, if you're an advisor and you're confident in what you have to say, I mean, you really can move the needle. So. Great. Thank you, Scott. And really, seriously, great having you back. So I, I hope to see you again soon. So, and um, I have a question. Yes. Uh, yeah, right. good. Sorry, I raised my hand. I don't even know if that thing works, but oh, it uh, does. I see it. Yeah. Okay. Have we? Have I just asking about if there is any data, or if it was mentioned and I missed it about the percentage of all cash deals, maybe at different price points, or if it's the overall market fine? I'm just curious what's happening on that. I don't have different price points, but I think the last time Johnny checked into into this, uh, Scotty, which was probably a month and a half ago at this point, I, it was it was a unbelievably high number <laughs> it's like 60 or 65 percent or something um it was it was a it was a high number it wasn't a low number it was i was like looking at this like oh my god is that correct and i mean he went back there and checked everything like that's that's what i see so um, i don't know if you guys are still seeing that trend today but that's what it was a while I ago am. i remember seeing a number wow. above 65 and to to a point that i had a uh one of my deals that they're financing and I almost could, I had to think about what had to happen with a financing deal because so many people are using cash in my transaction. Yeah. I, I heard 70% was the number I heard. Uh, but um, all right, guys, so let's keep moving. We have Naomi and Brian for the first half still we want to get to Brian Lewis and Naomi. So Naomi, you first, uh, good to see you. I know you missed last, last session. So happy to see you again. Uh, what are your thoughts on the market? Thank you so much. Uh, well, I um, learned from a very wise man, Fred Peters, that said, you know, we all have to live somewhere. And I feel that life <laughs> does go on despite the craziness that's around us. So I always remember you saying that, Fred. So thank you for instilling it in my brain. You know, I think it, it gives you a positive outlook on anything, on everything because we all have to live somewhere, right? So going back to the number, I was also going to say five, but now I won't. I'm going to say a six and a half because I feel it's a market Ooh. for opportunity. And I'll tell you from my experience and my listings, if it's priced right and it shows well, I've gotten multiple bids on two of my uh, sales in the last few months, but I've had real issues with financing. So the first one that I had multiple bids, we ended up taking a offer that was mortgage contingent 
And I think we made a mistake because it took forever to get it released. We closed at the end and we closed above ass, but the law, and, and this was in a building that local law 11 had just wrapped up. So the, the issue with local law 11 is real. Uh, and then now I'm, I have a listing in a building that also just wrapped up local law 11, yet I haven't yet gotten a bank <laughs> that is willing to uh, say yes to it until afterwards. So I actually took a, a lower, um, I, we accepted a lower offer, all cash uh, for this one. And, and much like, I think it was William who said, the um, taking forever to get the contract signed. Like I've, I've never had due diligence last for this long. And we're in touch with the, the, the attorneys and all oh, we we still need this and we still need that. So I, I don't see urgency even when it's multiple bid type thing, because they know that we have other people that are interested, but no one's or like, okay, so just give it to somebody else. So I think there's a lot of opportunity out there for the person who's really needing to buy and the person that's needing to sell. There are deals to be done. And, and again, I think we've said it in every single talk we've ever had, it must be priced right. And priced right is like Brian always says, has to be, it's not a science, just it's, it's gotta be a dot below the market value. And when that happens, uh, you know, you get floods of people coming in. And I also did an open house that I was shocked and how many people came. So it's that people are out there. You just need to be uh, priced right. And, and the conditions obviously have to um, be there. So six and a half for opportunity. Thank you, Naomi, so much. And you led us perfectly to Brian Lewis. Brian Lewis, I can't believe you're in the house. You're like the snuffleupagus of this group. Like you're, I always think you're going to come and then... And then you can't you're like, where is Brian? So you're, you're in the flesh. We're happy I'm so to glad see to be here. So, Can you guys hear me? Yeah. So good okay. to see you. Yeah. You Hi, sound everybody. great. You sound great. So Brian, good what do you, what are you thinking on the market? What are you thinking? Uh, well, as a very wise man once said, this shit's hard. Um, it really is. I, I, um, I love seeing you, Fred and Noah. You guys are awesome. Scott, everything you say is smart. Um, hi. So, okay. I, I would give it a four point nine nine five. Yeah, hi Mark. Four point nine nine five because you want to be just a little bit under, right? Five. No, I would say it's closer <laughs> to four. I would say closer to four. four. I, four. Right? Okay. So uh, the I, I you know I get asked to do these like quarter two wrap up interviews, and I saw so I was going through all my data and I was looking and I was like, okay, it, it's all regional, from what I my perspective, my downtown rocking. My upper west, upper east, depending, you know, some uh, my private sales, we have the compass private stuff where people don't want to clock the days on market. That stuff's we're, we're selling off of that. We're selling off of private. Um, we share it with everybody, but if they pull it, it's only for compass eyes and for me to talk to you guys about. I can't market it, but we've 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 hit at different price points on private. Because there are some people, to your point, Scott, where you don't want them on the market clock and days, and you're like, this isn't your moment. But we could put it on privately and just talk to certain people about it, and that's a way to get your aspirational pricing out of your system. So then you can be a little <laughs> more sober when you want to hit the market. Uh, but pricing right, like what market is pricing right not advisable, right? Even, even in a market where you throw everything on and it goes pricing right will be better than two you'll just get more more offers so i i always try to price it right if you ever see one of our listings sitting there i assure you it wasn't my idea i've got one at 923 fifth right now we're gonna have our uh i think our second annual uh party we're gonna have a parade on fifth avenue <laughs> time listed it's a steal and all the things on it i can't control the the things that people have grief about. So I, I always try to price, right. I do my best. Some people just want to be on the market and the guy's been loyal to me. So I'm happy, but I'm doing a lot of reach out to brokers like you guys regionally. We have this townhouse in Harlem. So I'm getting the top agents in Harlem to literally come one-on-one, -on -one, not a big broker event and walk it with me and go, what would you do? You have my buyer. What, what's, what do I do here? 
you're a good fisherman in these waters. What bait do I use? Where do I cast? What time do I fish? Like, let's go. I just want to catch fish. So, and that, that, that's, that stuff's very helpful. Just literally a direct email, a direct text, come, let's hang out. I'll, I'll return the favor. I'm finding that that connection, this is a market where connectivity uh, is really important, I believe. And to your point, Noah, about a good time to be a smart agent, I, I just boots on the ground, relationships, talking, it helps. Yesterday in Harlem at 121st, having one of those broker conversations led to another conversation about something I've got on 113th Street. That's a condo. They're bringing a buyer because they, it wasn't on their radar. So just trying to network it in different ways. We had a, a Soho condo. I had put it on two years ago. And the day I put it on, the building caught on fire. Um, nobody was hurt. We pulled it off. We relaunched. He wanted to get nine. We got eight, three. We did it. We got it. We got it done. But I'm also seeing more people want to list concurrently as a sale and a rental to hedge their bets. I've got one in Sutton Place, which oddly is busy. Sutton and Beekman have been sleepy, but second quarter, they were up. They were up. And I uh, that's impressive to me. I don't know if it's the new walkway there, but we... Uh, 920, uh, excuse me, at uh, 444 four, four East 57th, pre-war condo done to the nine central air, have it on for sale and rental and neither bucket is getting filled. And it's an owner pays rental, 17,500. The sale price 3295. They've been transferred to Palm Beach. They've got to do something. So if you have anybody, let me know. But we have a, a few of those things happening where you're like, gosh, this has value written all over it. Is it really always just price is a question I'm having in my head lately, right? Is it really always just price? I used to always yeah. say it was always price. So I'm, I'm, I'm we're getting the deals done. The building. Yeah. It's, there's a lot. Yeah. It's region. It's, it's very, building. Very, yeah, it's very all the things. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's. And the maintenance people are very wary about these high maintenances that they've all seen now. And, uh, you know, they know they're, it's all going to go up. It's not never coming down. So that's and, a, and Mark that's a and assessments, that. right? Some yeah. of these, I'm getting a lot of people asking me, what's the plan for, is it local all 98 guys? Just make me smart for a minute. Is it 98? The new one in 2028 is the, your energy grades. And 97, all that? 97, 97, excuse me. So I've had some buildings have no plan at all and they have a D and you're like, I, what's your plan? Like, what are you going to do? And I've got some buildings where they have assessments till 2031. So I'm having my owners prepay them, just take it off the table. And we're doing what we can and we're pricing right. We're getting it done. We're, we've, we've had a tremendous amount of closings this year. I don't mean that in a braggadocious way whatsoever, but it's a slog, right? It's a slog for the seller. It's a slog for us. We're doing it. Uh, we're sharper now. Our systems are sharper. This made us better. This has made us better. We're, we're, I can't wait for a good, great, easy market because we're just all going to like reel it in. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that spring was weird. Second quarter was up because of all the things we said. We got excited about, you know, tail into Q4, Q1. We got excited about rates and that never happened. But what do you think the rate needs to be to make certain people get off their butt? Sub I six? Fed, I, think the, I think the Fed just needs to do something, go down in a quarter, a half, something, just a movement in that direction to, to spark just the slightest more interest for, for real estate and the city at least. Yeah. Um, and I think it will happen before the, before the election. I know it's not connected to politics, but. Hey guys, I want to uh, just move it forward. Uh, Brian, thank you so much. Brian, did you have anything else you wanted to close with or are you good for now? No, Cause we no, have a second. Good. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for those thoughts. So uh, this is my fault because we were supposed to have a half hour left and we have like 15 minutes left. But let's try to see what we could do pretty quickly. I, I just need you to be pretty quick, everyone. This is the second half now of our discussion. 
And I think it was important to have that long on the first half because th the market is a struggle and it's really helpful to hear all this context and hear everyone's opinion. So I'm glad we did it. But now it's time to talk about just specific tips. Try to give just one. We'll have time at the end to go back around if, if some tip hasn't been mentioned. But this type of market can be a real struggle if you're, especially if you're a newer agent. But honestly, even if you're not a new agent, it's like, like we all said, it's a challenge for everyone. So I asked the agents and the experts on the panel to think of one tip that can really help you thrive in this market. We have a lot of experience on the panel. So we're just gonna go around quickly. If you could just think of one. Um, no, I don't know if you wanna go. I, I, I wasn't, do you wanna, no, do you have a tip you wanna go? I wasn't necessarily gonna start with you, but since you're up there, do you wanna throw one out? No, go ahead. Let's, let's, I'm okay. more curious to yeah. see what you realize. Yeah, yeah, so let's start. Uh, Fred, Frederick, Frederick Warburg Peters, do you have one? Fred is okay, Phil. You don't need to say my entire name every I, time. I like Frederick Warburg uh, Peters. I like that. Okay, Fred. All right, Fred, what do you got? Build relationships. That's my build tip. Relationships. My awesome. tip is build relationships. Those are the people with whom you can make deals, the people who trust you. And the reason they trust you is because you've built a relationship with them based on your knowledge of the marketplace and your reputational history. So uh, actually, there's a corollary to that, build relationships, which is, and I'm saying this all the time to my own agents, don't be an asshole. Because there are so many people who are hard to work with out there and you make life more difficult for everyone. So build relationships and make sure you're building them with agents as well as with clients. Awesome. Thank you, Fred. Okay, Brian, what do you got for us? I'd say is my tip is, uh, which oh, Brian? Oh, the Brian. Sorry, Brian. Yeah, we got, you got two Brians now, man. See, Brian? Brian Lewis is what happens when you don't come on the panel a lot. Go ahead, Brian. We got to recruit another Brian. <laughs> Go ahead, Brian Morgan. What do you got? I'd say uh, treat your buyers as if you were the buyer yourself and treat your sellers as if you were the seller yourself. I think people I like really that. appreciate honesty and transparency. And sometimes you have to give people bad news. And if you have to give them bad news, support it with data. Um I think uh, uh, Nikki was talking about that before. Uh, you know, I think it's really important not just to know the uh, data off you know, the top of your head when you're having conversations. That's important too, but also with your customers to keep sharing what's happening in the market in their specific neighborhoods. I talk a lot about contract activity so people can see, oh, if my property is not moving, it's not just me. This is what's going on in the market overall and maybe in the area as well. So uh, I think you need to be honest with your customers and transparent, as I said before, and keep sharing data because if you don't, then they're going to think it's your fault when maybe it's just the market. And maybe it is awesome. your fault too. Maybe it is your fault too. But, all right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're not all perfect and we're not all doing everything right. But uh, a lot of the times it's it's brokers are afraid to have these difficult conversations with their owners and you can't let that fear because that fear is giving your owners or buyers in some circumstances a disservice and you don't want to do that you're doing them a thank favor you. by being honest yes thank you so much brian okay dan morello what do you got uh don't be an asshole that's a joke Weird <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that, that's quickly going to become a meme by the way <laughs> nice. um i would say right now if you're not slow like dive deep in your network and to Fred's point is really just get back to relationships because when this market turns, um, you'll do very well. Uh, and that's on top of my recommendation be before regarding your listings and making sure that you have all the objections covered before you hit the market. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. All right, William, what's yours? Oh, Dan kind of stole my thunder. I was, what I was, I'll frame it differently. There is so much pent up demand being created in this market, and it has been being created for the past 18 months. So um, channel that into staying on top of your game with regards to staying in touch with past clients, whatever marketing you do. I do networking, all those things, because it's going to turn on a dime 
in in and just be ready and have and be top of mind when all of those people come off the fence because they absolutely will. We have all seen it before and it will happen very quickly. Thank you, William. All right, Mark D. I think you're still muted. I lost my I lost my cursor. Um, I I agree. <laughs> I think you know. Listen, and when you if you're down right now, if you're if you have some time, just network. You know this. You know I'm not sure the advice is to young brokers or to, but to everybody. You know keep keep your circle, your your sphere of inf influence, and all of that together. And yeah, it, we have a lot of pent up stuff going on. So it, the floodgates will open, uh, but you just have to keep doing one on ones. Go out to lunch with people and and uh, you know keep them close. Thank you, Mark D. Scott Harris. Well, I would have said uh, something along the lines of, you know, that being being don't be nice, that you got to be kind, you got to be firm, you got to give the news. But that's already been said. I would say, you know, if, if somebody's trying to um, help people move forward, tell good, tell your stories, you know, tell your success stories and tell your failures. Talk about where things are working for buyers and where they're not when buyers are being too greedy, when they're bidding too low and they're losing deal after deal and talk about the sellers and what it took to get seller deals into contract. I think telling those stories cuts through all of the, well, how's the market? Because again, the market is a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I think if you can tell stories, I think people are going to really, you know, they're going to have some social proof about how other people got deals done in this market. And I think that's the most important thing you can do. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Naomi. Thank you, Phil. Um, I think practicing gratitude is really important. Thank your buyers. Thank your sellers. Uh, and, you know, you're just your energy out there uh, will make a difference. And uh, gratitude is something really important to practice. Thank you, Naomi. All right, Brian. This is the Brian Lewis. Brian Lewis. The other Brian. Um, the other I think being the best GPS you can be. Uh, being knowledgeable. And when I say GPS, we all get frustrated with our clients, but if you tell your client to take a right and they take a left, don't get upset with them. Just say, I'm going to get you there, but here's the data, here's the stuff. And just be the really a really good champion for them through and through. And that loyalty will get you that extension on that exclusive when it's running out because they overpriced. And yeah, I just think being a really smart, clear GPS and not emotional mm. about it. GPS, I like that. Thank you, Brian. Okay, Scotty, what do you got? Um, shit, I mean, we all like going to like these $40 million penthouse with the free sushi broker open house thing. Um, you know, but maybe, yes, you can do that. But also, like, now that brokers are doing so many actual open houses, like public open houses, kind of like they should be doing them or somebody should be doing them where you don't have to make an appointment, you can just go by. I try to hit as many open houses in the neighborhoods, you know, that I work in as I can at price points that my clients are mostly in, which is under $2 million because I just want to be an actual expert on all of these things. So when it comes down to then being able to tell anecdotes about the apartments and, oh, this one I saw a couple of weeks ago just went into contract, but here's what was good, here was, was not good about it. And then you can share those stories with clients. So as I think it was Mark who said, cutting through all the data just with the anecdotes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Like see the product like in person as much as you can. And especially if you don't have um, a listing on a Sunday to do an open house, like, you know, it's okay. We have plenty of other days where we can probably take off and go to the beach and do whatever, but like go on Sunday for an hour or two and just hit some open houses, see the products, try to piggyback on appointments, maybe brokers, have during the week of the properties that you want to see if they're not doing an open house and get to know all of these pro uh, all these properties intimately. So when you are taking out people, you can kind of explain exactly what's going on in the market and what type of apartments they can expect and maybe even nudge them to areas that they didn't want to go, let's say above 15th street, 
but let me tell you, there's something on 18th Street that's really close to what you're looking for. Things of that nature. So kind of getting back to the basics of just being a broker and getting out there. Um, Scott, you reminded me of something I used to always say to my clients, is that is, there's no substitute for actually seeing the property. Like you can't understand the views, you can't understand the renovations, and you can't understand the light. Those three things are really hard to understand without actually seeing the property. And uh, it's helpful when you're comparing properties too and doing pricing analysis, that kind of stuff. Um, so thank you, Scotty, for that. Nikki, I see you're, you are rejoined. Uh, do you have a tip for us? Oh, I'm still, I'm still here. I will say, you know, everybody right. has said everything I would say, but I would add to it, pay attention to where your clients are moving to and from and lean into those relationships with those agents in those markets so that you can actually tell them what's going on in our market. And you will probably end up with referral listings and sales. So all those things, plus your, your network of agents as well and affiliated awesome. professionals. Thanks, Nikki. Nikki, I thought you rejoined because somehow you wound up at the very and the bottom of the of the Zoom call. You were in the beginning and now you're at the end. So I don't know how that happened. But anyway, um, I'm not an expert on Zoom. So, uh, OK, so I can't believe we did it. It's actually 12 now. Somehow we did it. It's amazing. But we don't have to end just a second. So before we do, I always like to see, does anyone have anything else they want to say? Maybe a tip wasn't mentioned that you want to mention, maybe something about the market. Anything, if anything at all. Uh, okay, I see a few hands raised. Uh, let's go, Scotty. I saw you first, and then Noah. Yeah, sure. I forgot. I forgot to add in. Like when you're, if you're working with buyers, like speak to your buyers about like you know they may have a lease coming up in December. Well, game out like how much time you need to look for a place and how much time it's going to take in contract to actually get to the finish line. So if somebody has a lease ending December, January, like know exactly when their lease is up, because if they, if we're getting down to three months prior to their lease being up, they may have to resign if they're nervous and then they're going to be waiting another 10 months to start looking again. So I think if you get a handle on exactly what their timeline is, you can, you can actually say, Hey, right now is actually a great time to start looking and being serious about it because it's going to take X amount of time. And what I find very interesting about a lot of buyers, particularly new ones, they don't realize how long a deal can take. So forget about how much time it takes to actually find the place. But once you get a, an accepted offer, how long the due diligence that can take, like, uh, I think someone said it's, yeah, it's going to be two weeks. Absolutely. I think Brian said that. But um, and then, you know, what it, board approval is the, you know, board meeting during the summer. You know, how much is the bank going to take if they're financing? So we have to really like give them a lot of length. And then I think they'll actually respect that and be very, very uh, put a lot of trust in you because you are respecting their timeline and being ahead of the game for them. So they're not like in a panic mode to have to re-sign and renew their lease. Great. Let's do, uh, thank you, Scotty. Let's do Noah and then Fred. I see Fred's hand raised. Go ahead, Noah. Yeah. First of all, thanks to everybody here. Um, great insights. And I just want to say, guys, you know what? We, we are eight years into this. Think about that for a second. We're eight years into this. Outside of the pandemic recovery period, which was not a really a normal time, since 2016, this market has had everything thrown at it. And look where we are. We should be down so much more than we are, and we're not. It tells you something about New York City. We've had capital controls. We've had the salt deductions removed. We've had a crippling rent regulations. We've had the mansion tax. We've had ground zero pandemic demographic shift. We had a commercial real estate hell that's going on in this market, right? Every country out there with investors, they're trying to keep those investors at home. We got an image problem. They're painting New York City as crime ridden. That's not like, I mean, we're, th there's, there's things going on that's affecting us. And don't be surprised if the next eight years out, right? You see some shifts the other way around. Don't be surprised if you see some policies get changed along. It may take time, but if that happens, you might see an undoing of what kind of took us to where we are now. And I think that's part of why we're in the volume trap that we're at. So there's a lot of interesting things that could happen with this market. And just the fact that we've 
held on and absorbed all those things, I think is quite telling. That's all. I just wanted to make that point. Thank you, Noah. Thank you very much. I think we all could applaud that. Um, Fred, if you have some thoughts, please. I saw your hand yeah, raised. Noah, from your mouth to God's ears. Um, yeah, I was going to say two things. One is something that's been reiterated over and over again in the chat, but I'm just going to say it again. Know the inventory. And that not only means going to see it. You know, for the first five years I was in the business, I spent every afternoon at least an hour just sitting with the floor plan books, familiarizing myself with what all of the floor plans in the areas that I was active looked like. Um, it's a great work to do. Know your inventory, not only by seeing it, because I agree that seeing it is critical, but know what they look like, know how they dovetail. You can't do enough of that work. That's my first thing that I wanted to say. My second thing is part of our job as brokers is to stretch the imagination of our buyers. Um, many of my most successful deals over the years were made with people in locations in which they had no interest when I first met them. And part of our job is that we know the city better than they do, and we are going to have a better idea for them of what works. So... I, Every showing, I always believe you should try to kidnap your brokers, your buyers, and take them to one place that they're completely not expecting. It's remarkable <laughs> how often that turns out to be the place they buy. Great thoughts. Great thoughts. Um, anyone else? I'm looking around to see if any of the raised hands, if, see if anyone else has anything else they want to say. Uh, the chat has been very healthy today. I, I'll get comments from you all later, but I think that was probably a successful risk that we took. Um, okay, so yes, I'm getting yet nods. All right, so I don't see any more hands raised, so I'm going to go with my closing comments now. Amazing discussion as always. If you're on this call and you're registered, I'll send out a summary. So you can send it out to all your clients if you want. As I always say, feel free to plagiarize any information that I send in those emails. Uh, make it your own, totally fine. Um, if it helps you, I'm happy. And thanks to everyone on the call in the audience. Thanks again to our amazing panelists. And if anyone has any feedback, please email me. I'd love to hear it. Until next time, and feel free to come off mute and say goodbye, and I hope everyone has a great July 4th. <laughs> and um, it's been great. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. You. Bye, guys. Take Thanks care, everybody. Take care, everybody. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Phil. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Phil. Sure.